Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you for joining Machine Learning Day on Google Open Source Live. If you haven't attended a Google Open Source Live before, it's a monthly web series where each month we explore a different topic within open source. And today, of course, it's all about machine learning. My name is Taya Lampkin, and I work on open source programs for AI and ML uh, at Google. ML is such a new and fast moving space that it's a fantastic time to get folks in the ecosystem collaborating in the open. Thank you, Taya. Good day, everyone. My name is Alex Bush. I'm head of marketing for Google Open Source at Google Cloud. And I'm really excited to co-host today's amazing event covering all things machine learning. Taya, can you please let the folks know what's in store for today? Um, we have some really interesting topics in store for you today. If you're looking to learn more about machine learning applications and infrastructure, you're in the right place. Um, to start us off, Amy Wang and Bhaktapriya Radharapu will be focusing uh, on a session on tools for responsible machine learning. Great. And don't forget to put your questions in the live Q&A form below the live stream window. Speakers are ready to answer your questions live, and we'll get to as many as we possibly can in the time allotted. Just a note, if you are viewing in full screen, you'll need to exit full screen to see the live Q&A forum. Our sessions have been pre-recorded to allow for accurate transcripts and so that speakers can focus on answering all the questions live. Once we're done, don't forget to join us at the after party. You'll see a button to join the event page at the end of the last session. And last but not least, use the hashtag Google OS Live to share your experience on social media. With that, let's get started. Hi everyone, my name is Amy and I'm a product manager working on Responsible AI. I'm here with Bhakti today to talk about the open source Responsible AI toolkit that we have, which can help you build fair, ethical, and responsible AI. Today, we'll be giving you a quick overview of Responsible AI at Google and the Responsible AI toolkit. We'll then demonstrate how you can use a few of these tools in a real world example. We'll start off with a quick introduction to Responsible AI. AI is used today in many different applications, and it's truly transforming the world that we live in. As creators of new products, it's staggering to see the range of new opportunities created by AI across many different sectors. However, for AI to be truly beneficial and useful, it needs to be built, tested, and operated responsibly. At Google, we have a set of principles that guide our approach to responsible AI. These include the seven listed here, as well as four applications of AI that Google will not pursue. We developed the Responsible AI Toolkit to operationalize these principles at Google. We launched the toolkit a few years ago and have been adding resources to it since. To understand the toolkit, let's take a look at a typical machine learning workflow. Building AI responsibly means answering hard questions at each step of the life cycle, from problem definition through to model training, testing, and deployment. The Responsible AI Toolkit is a collection of technical resources and tools to help you and your team answer these hard questions at each step. They're built in a flexible way so they can fit in with your workflow. We encourage you to take a deeper look at these resources online which include documentation, guidance, and collab tutorials. Today, we're going to focus on four specific tools that can help you evaluate and remediate your models for bias and also communicate details about your model to relevant stakeholders. And we'll be doing this with a quick example. So you can imagine that you're the owner of a new restaurant chain and your customers are leaving online reviews about their experience. Since you're a diligent owner, you decide to build a sentiment classifier that assesses whether each customer's comment is positive or negative towards their experience at your restaurant. The inputs to the sentiment classifier are the text of the review, the review metadata, such as who the user was who left the review, and any associated images. We're starting with two objectives to make sure that our model performs without bias. First, we want to ensure that our sentiment classifier has a high overall accuracy for predicting sentiment. Second, we want to make sure that the classifier does not disproportionately misclassify reviews based on sensitive identity characteristics that are mentioned in the review. We're going to start with 
gender for now, although we know that this isn't comprehensive and there are other sensitive characteristics that we should also look at. And we also have listed here the North Star metrics that we want to look at when we evaluate these two objectives. So to make it clear what the bias might look like, let's look at a specific example. Here we have two uh, reviews that are saying very similar things. As you can see, these should both be classified as positive sentiment. However, the first review has a term that's referencing the female gender, waitress, and it's classified incorrectly. We'd want to quantify the significance of bias similar to this across the model and then take action to remediate it. Let's look at how the responsible AI toolkit can be used to tackle the two objectives we've set out to address. We'll start by using fairness indicators to perform a disaggregated or sliced evaluation of your model's performance to determine whether or not this model is achieving these objectives. So fairness evaluation is challenging because it's highly contextual and almost never reducible to a single statistical definition. In any real world setting, it's important to acknowledge and embrace this fact and explore multiple qualitative definitions and statistical measures of fairness. Real-world ML systems also operate at a very large scale, so you need tooling that allows you to evaluate your model on large data sets and as part of repeatable pipelines. Fairness indicators can help solve some of these challenges by making it easy to zero in on the performance of your model for specific subgroups or demographics. First, it comes preloaded with some common fairness metrics, which means you don't have to commit to a single definition up front. Secondly, fairness indicators is scalable and flexible. Um, it can be run as part of TFX's evaluator component, as a TensorBoard plugin, or as standalone binaries. It also supports both TensorFlow and non-TensorFlow models. And finally, Fairness Indicators provides an interactive UI and dashboard that you can use to explore and share the results of your analysis with others. So let's go back to our example. We can use Fairness Indicators to evaluate our first objective, which is accuracy. We use the presence of gender identity terms as the category in question for our sliced analysis. We wouldn't want the presence of these terms to unduly influence the outcome of the classifier. Fairness indicators shows us that reviews containing terms implying certain genders actually have a lower accuracy than other reviews, which is pretty concerning. Now we turn to our second objective, which is to minimize any differences in error rates and specifically false positive rates. This graph shows us that reviews containing terms that imply certain genders tend to have a higher FPR or false positive rate than other reviews. This means that they are far more likely to be classified incorrectly as positive, which can lead to biased, misleading conclusions for your assessment efforts. When we looked at the other gender category, while the false positive rate appears to be lower, the line that you can see here indicates the confidence interval. And the confidence interval is very large, spanning from zero to uh, the top, which is 0.55, um, which means we don't have a good sense of what this value is. So we want to gather more data in this category to understand what this metric actually look looks like. So now Bhakti will explain how to use the model remediation library to address some of these issues that we've found. Thank you, Amy. Once you've identified bias in your model, there are several ways to address fairness concerns in, in the model. And TF Model Remediation Toolkit comes in handy here. There are several ways to address fairness concerns in your model. You could tackle this at the data pre-processing level where you can collect more data or upsample data to improve performance over the minority slices. Or you could add special constraints or losses to your model as training time modeling techniques. You could also alter the interpretation of outputs of the model post-training. You can use in the TensorFlow Model Remediation Toolkit, which offers several training time techniques to mitigate bias in ML models. Today, I'll be sharing two techniques from this suit today to address the fairness concerns that Amy showed us previously. Imagine we are trying to train our sentiment analysis model, and we'd like the false positive rates of both the male and the female groups to be the same. 
You can add MINDEF laws to your model to equalize the distributions of the majority and minority groups in this case. MINDEF is excellent for achieving group fairness, ensuring equality of opportunity. You can add MINDEF laws to your training and co-train it with the original objective of your model to bridge the gap between the lowest performing group and the best performing group. In our case, upon adding the MINDEF laws to our training, we may notice that the false positive rates for our target groups have not only improved, but the overall gap between the male and the female subgroups has also reduced. TensorFlow Model Remediation Toolkit also offers counterfactual logic pairing. Now this comes in handy if changing the term waiter to waitress is causing your model to flip its decision about a review. If your model is susceptible to changing its prediction solely based on the presence of an identity attribute, you can use counterfactual logic pairing uh, within the TensorFlow Model Remediation Library. The loss is essentially another technique that you can add and co-train your model with. It penalizes the model for different predictions on the counterfactual pairs and it ensures counterfactual fairness in your models. Now, to debug your models further, you can also use the language interpretability tool. With the language interpretability tool, you can visualize your data set, you can see predictions for each data point, and understand what kinds of examples your model is performing poorly on. You can also compare counterfactual pairs in your data set to detect bias in your model. For example, the waiter and the waitress example that we saw earlier. You can also understand how each token in the sentence is contributing to the model's prediction with lit. Finally, as you're about to deploy and monitor your model in the world, you can also use the model card toolkit to generate transparency artifacts to communicate key ethical considerations to your stakeholders. Communicating key gaps and ethical considerations in an ML model is important not only for the model owners and maintainers, but also the model overseers and the end users. Model cards is one such framework that helps you communicate these key ethical considerations with the stakeholders of your project. Model card toolkit, which is also an open source offering, helps you generate such model cards and transparency artifacts for your model in an easy fashion. Here's an example model card for the restaurant sentiment model that highlights key use cases, limitations, and ethical considerations of the model. It also talks about who built the model and how. You can also share details about how your data was curated, how the model was trained, and on what subgroups and slices your model was evaluated on. We recommend using model cards every time you publish your model uh, to the world. With that, I would like to wrap up and I thank you for your attention. Uh, please be sure to check out the Responsible AI Toolkit on our website uh, for more resources and tutorials. Thank you. Thanks, Amy and Bhakti. What I loved about this talk is seeing how AI fairness requires considerations at every part of the machine learning lifecycle. I'm really excited about the work this team is doing to release resources for anyone building uh, machine learning applications. And we love to learn from other teams too as part of it. Next, we'll hear from Luis Gustavo Martins, a longtime developer advocate for TensorFlow. He'll be sharing more about TensorFlow Hub, um, which makes available machine learning models for everyone. Take it away, guest. Hi, everyone. I'm Gus and I work as a Google AI developer advocate. Today, I'd like to talk to you about TensorFlow Hub and how it can help you adopt machine learning on your product or research. As developers, we are always trying to figure out how to build solutions for a project. When we're faced with a challenge, we think, how can I solve this? What's the right tool for the job? And in many situations, machine learning is the answer. Machine learning can help us make many tasks like detecting objects in an image, classifying audio events, or even in understanding text. But building machine learning models may take a lot of time, use large amounts of data, require a lot of expertise in the field, and be very resource intensive. But what if, instead of starting from scratch, maybe someone has already solved the same problem you have, or at least solved a very similar problem that could give you a good starting point. 
this is where TensorFlow Hub can help you. TensorFlow Hub is a place where you can find machine learning modules for all your needs. On TensorFlow Hub, you can find thousands of TensorFlow modules for you to use with documentation and full sample code. And you can try the modules right in your browser if you want. There, you can find models for all kinds of tasks like image, text, audio, and video. TF Hub is composed of two components. The first one is the website, tfhub.dev. There is where you can search for models, read their documentation, and much more. Let's take a look in more detail. The models available on TensorFlow Hub, there was a lot of investment energy to making them very easy to use and reuse and to compose with their own models. With one line of code, models can be pulled into TensorFlow for retraining with your own data. This works whether you are using a high-level tf.keras API or a low-level API. Uh, they can also be used in machine learning pipelines through TensorFlow Extended, or TFX for short. TensorFlow Hub, you can also discover ready-to-use modules for TensorFlow Lite, TensorFlow.js, and Coral Edge TPU devices. These models were optimized by experts to give the best performance on the places you deploy them. TensorFlow Hub has thousands of models available with documentation and code snippets. And for some, we have even simple demos on the, that you can try directly in the browser. Some of these demos uh, you can see here on the, on the screen, uh, some of them are brought to life with interactive visualizers. Some of our publishers have created custom components to highlight their amazing work where you can try out the model on your own image or audio clip directly in the browser. We are working to increase the number of visualizers, but I strongly encourage you to try the one for bird recognition, for example. TensorFlow Hub models also have an interactive collab to book links that allow you to play with the models in code right from the browser, powered by Google infrastructure with nothing to install and completely free. You just click on that button there, and all the code you use on the model will be there readily available for you. Make it easier for you to add the model to your application. Beyond the site, with all the features that we've just seen, TensorFlow Hub also has a library to make use of these models very easy. With one line of code, you can load a model and have it ready to use for inference or for fine tuning or transfer learning. Let's take a look in more detail. Before going to some code examples, let's understand how the library works internally. From a model handle or the URL to read the model's documentation, you can use the method load, and internally it will verify the local cache. If that model is not present yet, the library will download it from TensorFlow Hub servers and a red load to memory for you to do inference. Next time you run the same line, TensorFlow Hub library will verify that the model already exists locally and load it for your memory uh, using less bandwidth on that. We know the internals, but how do we use it in our own code? Let's see one example. Audio classification is a task of finding events in an audio file, like if there's a dog barking or a siren playing or people talking. Here, we have the code to do exactly that using a very good model called YAMNet. In the third line, you create a variable with the model handle. If you just paste that URL in your browser, you will see its full documentation and all the explaining you need to use the model. Below it, we load it using the load method. In the next, next lines, we just load an audio file and run the inference. This model specifically returns three things, and those results are what is plotted in the image below the code. As you can see, downloading and loading the model is basically one line of code. Let's talk a little bit about transfer learning. We've seen how to use a model directly on the previous slide for audio classification. But what if I have my own data and I want to customize my model for my data? This is a very common use case. And for this, we can use a technique called transfer learning. The idea behind it is, you know how to speak one language. Let's suppose English. If you decide to learn Portuguese, you won't have to start from scratch. You know the basics of syntax rules, 
and how to produce sounds with your mouth. So what you need to learn is the new words and how to use them. This is the basic idea behind transfer learning. You can use this technique in image, text, audio, or video domain. Let's take a look on the image domain. You have a model that already knows how to do something. For example, classifying image in a thousand classes like dog, cat, table, vase, and all of that. Now, you want to make this model learn about your specific classes. The model already knows how to extract features from an image, and that's the hard part. Let's try a basic example, finding out if bean leaves have a plant disease. This example is also on the link shown here. To start, we can find a data set with image of bean leaves on TensorFlow datasets. We can just load it and use it. It's already labeled and split it into train and evaluation splits, just to make our life easier. We can even add a pre-processing function if we would need to normalize the images or do some other pre-processing or even some image augmentation. Now what? Let's create a very basic model. To do an image classification, we want to extract features from the image and then define a new class for those features. TensorFlow Hub enables you to stand on the shoulders of giants by using pre-trained models to help you. Here, instead of using hub.load that we used in the previous example, we will use the other method called Keras layer method. This loads the model in a state that can be used as a layer in your model. Here we create a very basic model. This gives an accuracy of 48%. This is not great, right? One thing we can do now to improve is to try another model from TensorFlow Hub. To do that, we only need to change the model handle, just that URL. This will load a different model for us, and it will already improve the results. It's not great yet. 60% is still a little bit low, but let's think about something. Coming back to our English and Portuguese analogy, uh, if instead of starting knowing English, I knew Spanish, that would make my learning of Portuguese much easier because both languages come from the same origin and are quite similar. Does this also uh, impacts machine learning? And yes, it does. A model trained on a similar data to mine may have a better understanding of the features I need. Let's do some last try with a model that was trained to recognize diseases on cassava leaves. Uh, what do you think will happen now? Well, as you can see, 96%. This is way better. This is very good. So we can see that this base model has a very good understanding of leaves. And that's why we get such a great results with the same data and the same base model around th this Keras layer. TensorFlow Hub enables this easy experimentation with models, making your task much easier. You just need to change one string and try with a different model and get such great results. This is the same idea, and it also works for text, audio, and video models. Same thing. If you want to see more examples and guides, uh, and for other problem domains, you can check out TensorFlow Hub's official documentation in these links here. TensorFlow Hub is a great resource for hackathons, where you might not have enough time to train a model from scratch, and the pre-trained models can get you some results faster, and later you can just fine-tune them if you want. TensorFlow Hub also is great for Kaggle competitions, where you can fine-tune one existing model to have a starting benchmark for your submission. As mentioned before, not all models on TensorFlow Hub are from big companies. Some of them are from the community, including Kaggle competitors, uh, and you too can also contribute and publish models. You can find more information on tfhub.dev. Let's do a quick recap. Four things you need to remember from this talk. TensorFlow Hub is a model repository for all your ML needs. It has models for all domains, image, text, audio, and video. It's easy to use, and to do transfer learning to your own data. With lots of state-of-the-art models contributed by top research labs and from the community to improve your own product. That's what I have for today. Thank you very much. 
Thanks, Gus. That was awesome. I love how we're making machine learning accessible to everyone with the work being done on TensorFlow and the open source community. Okay, next we'll hear from Khan, who will be highlighting on-device machine learning. Over to you, Khan. Hi, everyone. My name is Kang from the TensorFlow team. And today I'll introduce you to a new field in machine learning called on-device machine learning. I'll show you how you can start using it in your applications. It's just a few lines of code. When talking about machine learning, many people may have an impression that machine learning models run on server side using powerful GPUs or powerful TPUs. However, edge devices like smartphones or IoT devices have become a very important platform for machine learning in recent years. On-device machine learning refers to a subfield of machine learning that trains and deploy machine learning models on those edge devices. But why is it important to run machine learning on edge devices? There are several reasons. The first one is latency. If you want to build a feature that requires real-time data processing, like processing video feed, then you definitely need to run the machine learning models on the devices. The second reason is offline availability. You can use the feature even when there's no internet connection. And the third reason is protecting user privacy. With the on-device machine learning, you don't need to send sensitive user data to the server for processing. And thanks to on-device machine learning, a lot of new features have become possible. Let me show you some examples. The first example is the virtual try-on feature on YouTube. In this demo, you can see that the user can try different lipstick colors using augmented reality in the app. This feature is powered by an on-device machine learning model that recognizes the user lips in real time and change the colors. Another example is the Google Translate app. It has a feature that allows you to capture text with your phone camera and translate them in real time without internet connection. Besides smartphone apps, on-device machine learning is also being used in many IoT devices. For example, this cleaning robot from Ecovax uses on-device machine learning to take obstacles on the floor so that it can clean the floor without getting stuck because of those items. We use TensorFlow to train and deploy machine learning models. However, TensorFlow was originally built to run on servers with a lot of computing power and memory. Most edge devices have a lot of power constraints that we didn't consider them when we started building TensorFlow. That's why we built TensorFlow Lite from scratch to be a machine learning framework specifically for deploying TensorFlow models on edge devices. TensorFlow Lite supports many different platforms, including Android and iOS smartphones, Linux-based IoT devices like the Raspberry Pi, microcontrollers, and even web browsers. Today, I'll show you how to build on-device machine learning applications using TensorFlow Lite. We'll cover three scenarios. First, I'll show you how to use a pre-trained TensorFlow Lite model to add on-device machine learning to your applications in just a few minutes. Second, I'll show you how to train a custom TensorFlow Lite model to implement machine learning use cases that are not supported out of the box by the pre-trained models. And finally, I'll show you how to convert TensorFlow models to TensorFlow Lite so that you can have the full power to customize your model. The first scenario is very easy, but it only offers very few options for customization. On the other hand, the third scenario offers a lot of flexibility for customization but it requires expertise in building machine learning models. Now let's start with the first option, using pre-trained TensorFlow Lite models. Pre-trained models are machine learning models that are already trained to do a specific task. For example, there's a pre-trained object detection model called Action Dead Lite. This model can recognize 70 types of different objects like dog, cat, keyboard, television, and many more. The model takes an image as the input and then returns a list of objects that it recognizes, together with the location of the objects in the image. For example, the model can tell that there's a dog and a cat in this image and where they are. Let me give you another example. There's a pre-trained audio classification model called YAMNET. YAMNET can recognize 521 different types of sound, such as 
music, speech, vehicle, can viewing, and many more. TensorFlow-Lite has a collection of sample applications that implement many different on-device machining use cases. You can find the sample apps for the two use cases that I just mentioned earlier, object detection and audio classification, as well as many other use cases like image classification or post estimation. There are sample apps for Android, iOS, and Raspberry Pi. You can clone the sample apps from GitHub and try them out. Here's a demo of the object detection Android sample app. It is a pre-trained Action Dex Lite model to detect different types of objects. You can see that it can recognize the keyboard, the mouse, my laptop, or water bottle. Here's another demo. This is the audio classification sample app running on a Raspberry Pi. You can see that it recognizes speech as I'm speaking. Now let's try some music. And what about some cat mewing? One important thing to take note here is that the machine learning models that I just show you run in real time and entirely on the local device. It means that the models run without any internet connection and no user data is sent to the cloud for processing. That's the power of on-device machine learning. Now, let me show you how you can integrate those machine learning models into your own application. First, you will need to download the pre-trained TensorFlow Lite model. There are many pre-trained TensorFlow models on TensorFlow Hub that you can choose from. For those who don't know, TensorFlow Hub is a free repository for TensorFlow pre-trained models. You can find models for many different machine learning use cases which are created by both Google and the TensorFlow community. Here's the Action Dead Light Zero TensorFlow Lite model that is used in the object detection sample app that I showed you earlier. You can download it and proceed to integrate that into your app. Once you have downloaded your model, you can use TensorFlow Lite task library to integrate the model into your apps. First, you need to add the TensorFlow Lite task library to your application. There are Android, iOS and Python libraries that you can choose from depending on your targeted platform. Next, let me show you how to integrate the object detection model to your Python application using the task library Python API. In your Python application, start by importing the vision module from the task library. Then initialize an object detector with the TensorFlow Lite model that you just downloaded from TensorFlow Hub. Now you need to prepare a tensor image to fit the input image to the object detector. You can load the image directly from a file using the createFromFile function, and then call the detect function on the tensor image to detect objects in that image. The detect function returns a list of detection objects, each representing an object that it found from the image. In each detection object, there's the object name, the confidence score, and the bounding box indicating the object location. And it's that simple. In just five lines of code, your Python application can now detect 70 different types of objects. TensorFlow Lite supports many different platforms, including Android and iOS smartphones. Integrating a TensorFlow Lite pre-trained model to a smartphone application is just as easy as what I show you with the Python application. For example, here's the Kotlin code that you need to write to integrate the TensorFlow Lite object detection model into an Android app. You start by creating an object detector with the TensorFlow Lite model that you downloaded from TensorFlow Hub. Then you create a tensor image object from the Android bitmap object that contains the image that you want to recognize. And finally, you call the detect function on the tensor image and get back the list of detected objects similarly to what you get from the Python API. Now we have seen how easy it is to add machine learning models to your app using a pre-trained TensorFlow Lite model. However, there are many times that you may want to do something that is not supported by the pre-trained models. So that's when you need to train a custom model. Let me give you an example. 
The pre-trained object detection model that we downloaded from TensorFlow can recognize 70 different types of objects, but it can't recognize the Android figurines that I have. So if I want to build an app to recognize these Android figurines, then I will need to train a custom model. So let me show you how to do that. There are three steps to do so. First, collect and label the training data. Then train a custom object detection model using TensorFlow-Lite Model Maker. And finally, deploy the model by replacing the model that you downloaded from TensorFlow Hub with a new custom model. You start with taking a lot of photos containing the objects that you want to detect. You can start with a dozen images for each type of object and train a prototype model. But to get a production quality model, you should aim for having more than 100 images for each type of object. Then use an image labeling tool to label the object that you want to detect in the image. I prefer a tool called Label IMG. It's an open source tool that you can download from GitHub. You can find the link to download the app in the video description. Once you have finished labeling your images, you can export the label data to start training the model. To train a machine learning model, you will need a powerful computer. My recommendation is to use Google Colab, which is a web-based tool to run Python programs. It offers free CPUs so that it can train custom machine learning models faster. Of course, if you want, you can also use your laptop or desktop to train models. Please note that although you need a powerful computer to train custom machine learning models, you can still deploy the trained model to edge devices which have limited computing power like a smartphone or Raspberry Pi. You start by installing Model Maker on Google Colab on your computer using pip. Just run pip install tflight model maker. And next is the Python code to train a custom model using Model Maker. You start with choosing the model spec or model architecture for your custom model. Here we use FNDET Lite 0, the same architecture with the pre trained model that we downloaded from TensorFlow Hub earlier. Then you load your data set using the object detector data loader. Then you start training your model. And after training the model, we use a test data set, which the model hasn't seen before, to evaluate the model accuracy. And finally, I export the model to deploy on edge devices. Now, as you have finished training the custom model, let's switch to the Android app to deploy it. Deploying the custom model is very easy. You can reuse the code in the demo app and just replace the pre-trained model with your custom model. Here's the custom model in action. You can see that it now detects the Android figurines rather than the general objects like the mouse. It's very easy, isn't it? You can also use Model Maker to train many other types of custom models, such as image classification, audio classification, or text classification models. If you want to learn more about using Model Maker, Please check out the tutorials on the TensorFlow-Lite website. You can find the URLs in the video description. Model Maker is a very easy to use tool to train custom on-device machine learning models, but it only supports a specific set of popular machine learning use cases and model architecture. If you want to implement an on-device machine learning use case that is not supported by Model Maker, you can build and train your custom model using TensorFlow. Then convert it to TensorFlow-Lite to deploy on edge devices. I'll show you how to do that. There are three steps that you need to take. First, you start with building and training your model using TensorFlow. Then you convert the model to the TensorFlow Lite format. And finally, you deploy and run the model on the edge devices using TensorFlow Lite runtime. The first step, training a TensorFlow model is the same as how you have been using TensorFlow. You start with uh, defining the model using the Keras API and start training the model. If you are a TensorFlow user, then it's the same thing as what you have been doing so far. The next step is to convert the TensorFlow model to TensorFlow Lite. You can use a TFLY converter class to convert your Keras model to the TensorFlow Lite format, and then save the model as a file so that you can deploy it on edge devices later. To optimize your model for deployment on edge devices, you can apply quantization when converting the model. Quantization means to reduce the number of bytes used to represent the model weights. 
for example, from 32-bit to 8-bit. And here's a benchmark of applying quantization on some popular computer vision models. These models become four times smaller at a loss of about 1% point in accuracy. Quantized models also run faster. For example, on a Raspberry Pi 4, a MobileNet V1 quantized model runs about two times faster than its original version. You can add quantization when converting your TensorFlow model to TensorFlow Lite by adding this one line of code. Okay, now we have converted your TensorFlow model to TensorFlow Lite. The final step is to deploy the model on your device. You will need to add the TensorFlow Lite runtime to your application. This library is different from the task library that I showed you earlier. There are Android, iOS, and Python libraries that you can choose from. And here's the Python code to run a TensorFlow Lite model. It's similar to how you use a TensorFlow Lite model with task library, but the main difference here is that TensorFlow Lite runtime requires the model inputs and outputs to be number arrays rather than the high level data types as in the case of task library. So that means you will have to write all the pre-processing and post-processing code by yourself. For example, converting from image object to a float array representing the image in the RGB format. You also need to specify which tensor is the input and the output of the model. I'm showing you the Python API, but the Android and the iOS APIs are very similar. So that was all the content for today. Let's recap what we have talked about. First, you can get started with all device machine learning by downloading the pre-trained TensorFlow Lite models from TensorFlow Hub and integrate them into your app in just a few lines of code by using TensorFlow Lite task library. Then I'll show you how to quickly train a custom TensorFlow Lite model by using ModelMaker. And finally, we talk about using TensorFlow Lite Converter to convert your TensorFlow model to TensorFlow Lite and how to use the TensorFlow Lite runtime to deploy it on Edge devices. Thank you for watching and please subscribe to the TensorFlow YouTube channel to learn more about machine learning at Google. Thanks, Khan. The TensorFlow Lite team has done so much to enable machine learning on low connectivity, low power devices. And it's not just our phones that benefit from it. ML at the Edge can even power soil moisture monitoring and agriculture to help farms use water more efficiently. Next up, Mashek will be discussing using job queuing to optimize for efficiency of your compute resources. Take it away, Mashek. Hi, my name is Maciej Kruszawski. I'm a product manager on Google Kubernetes Engine. And today I'm going to give you a short presentation on um, the value of using job queuing to optimize for efficiency of your compute resources in your cluster. And I will present to you a new class job queuing operator that we have built to solve that problem. So actually, we're going to start um, the conversation first with the definition of the problem that we're trying to solve. Um, and uh, to get us uh, started in here, let's talk about the main term or the main term, the main definition in this context, which is what is a job? So we're trying to better execute computations that run to completion. So they have a start and they have an end. Um, and um, they are seen by Kubernetes as a group of pods. Uh, they may be loosely coupled and they may run all fully independently. They may also be tightly coupled so those pods can collaborate and communicate between each other. Very frequently, um, these um, uh, workloads will be flexible. Uh, the most common uh, um, characteristic on which they are flexible is time, but sometimes they are also flexible on location, on reliability, or other uh, aspects of the job, like the resources that is uh, running on. And um, at a higher abstraction layer, what is a job queue, or what is job queuing as a concept? Uh, it's essentially a concept of uh, um, deciding when each job is going to run and holding ones which should wait and then letting others run. So you are assigning your workload to resources in your cluster in a controllable and predictable sequence. Um, why job queuing is actually important? Um, first of all, 
uh, in most environments, in most uh, situations, you will be in a, in a in under un, you will be under some constraints. You will usually have more jobs than resources that you have to execute them. In an on-premises environment, typically that's going to be driven by the fact that your clusters are static um, and the, the demand for jobs and computations just increases. Uh, when it comes to cloud environment, typically your workloads are going to be um, limited by some budgetary uh, aspects like discounts, quotas, or uh, maybe scalability of the software stack that you're using. Uh, so what we need and what is what is needed really to solve these problems is, uh, first of all, we need an operator that will queue jobs. So we'll offer this basic minimal capability of executing jobs in some form of like first in, first out uh, queue. But then you also need capabilities or parameters to uh, control the execution order and maybe apply priorities, for example. You may need also some mechanisms for fair sharing so that mm, lower priority workloads would not be stranded forever without being able to run. Uh, you may need a concept of budgeting, so the limit uh, against which your um, queuing operator should run might be one that uh, that works against a point in time quota, but it might be also driven by some overtime budgets and overtime consumption. You may need to set up some policies, um, for example, who may use high tier, um, most expensive GPUs in your cluster. You may also have some other um, uh, needs to control where each job runs, um, uh, how it uses, uh, how it's allocated to certain types of resources. And uh, so, um, to to solve these problems, we are we've built an operator called Q. Um, and I uh, would like to, in a couple of words, I would like to cover why we believe this is the uh, uh, the right tool for solving uh, solving the problem of job queuing and efficiency of resources. Um, there are alternative um, uh, approaches to how you how you solve that, and there are um, queuing operators uh, in the eco in the Kubernetes ecosystem, um, but. Um, they come with certain challenges. So first one is the most basic. So just using plain Kubernetes, it does come with the notion of uh, workload priorities, but it's very microservices centric. Uh, it was built with the with the workloads like deployments in mind. Uh, so it will try to run all of the workloads that were created. It will try to run all of them, create all of the pods. If it has less resources than it it needs to, to, to run all pods. Um, it will um, preempt all the ones that have a lower priority. Uh, and uh, as a result, it may face uh, problems with um, um, uh, it, predictability of how you run workloads, or even it may cause reliability problems or outages. Uh, so, so the workload would actually never complete and never run. Um, now, there are some alternative implementations of, um, of job queuing um, created by some third-party controllers. Now, the main common um, challenge with using those is that they come with re-implementation of some of the core Kubernetes components. The most common re-implementations that we've seen are custom schedulers and custom uh, job um, controllers. So they have their own job lifecycle management. Um, Re-implementation of these two typically uh, leads to problems with integration of auto-scaling um, and as a result um, to many challenges of uh, running them in, in cloud environment. Uh, so um, there is really a need for a queuing operator that would not go into any conflicts with scheduler, with uh, the job controller and with cluster auto-scaler. Uh, so what we are proposing is uh, Q.sh, so Q as an operator, and Q.sh is the website where you can find uh, details about it. It's a queuing operator that has very slim, very simple implementation. It, the only thing that it does is it decides which jobs to run, which to not run, so to keep them suspended. I'll talk about the API in a second. Um, 
it reuses um, core Kubernetes components to maximum. If we found that any core Kubernetes component um, is not meeting our needs when it comes to um, supporting jobs and fits for things like machine learning training or some maybe batch uh, inference, uh, we uh, we fixed that or we are fixing that, meaning that we are adding new features and new capabilities to the core components. Um, and you can probably best witness that by looking at the pipeline of improvement that are being made to the job API. Um, and such slim implementation where we, we only focus on the job queuing um, functionality and the rest we leave either to other ecosystem tools or to the core Kubernetes components means that uh, queue integrates very well and does not go into any unnecessary conflicts with uh, the rest of the ecosystem and core Kubernetes. So let's talk really about the resource model and how to use it. So um, Q introduces two primary new custom resources that you need to think about. Um, one is a namespace level Q, um, and it's a wrapper that allows you to group uh, identical jobs or jobs that should be reasoned um, uh, as, as the same ones, as identical to one another. So Q may represent a priority. It may represent some... some I, I mean, you actually expect that in most cases, queues will just simply represent priorities of jobs that run inside your, your namespace. Um, when it comes to um, cluster level resources, we're introducing a cluster queue, which then represents uh, a pool of resources in the cluster to which um, various tenants or various users in your cluster will have access to, and queue will manage which job can run using that particular cluster queue. We are also heavily using the namespace concept, which is a core Kubernetes um, resource. And um, Namespaces essentially represent tenants in your cluster. This might be a user, so uh, so like a researcher, data scientist um, that's training models, or it may be um, a team, but it's still um, a, a group of users that should be reasoned as a single entity um, in uh, that are using that namespace. Um, now, um, there may be multiple of of course namespaces that are using the same um, the same um, uh, cluster queue and um, queue will decide which jobs are executed and when and when they are getting access to to resources queue supports also much more complex um, configurations where you have multiple pools of resources so multiple cluster queues um, it does support also borrowing mechanisms I will go a little bit into de more detail um, in the API examples section and of course you can have multiple namespaces with with queues you may have multiple queues per namespace too so let's actually take a look at the um, API um, so first let's go into the most simple uh, part. So, uh, the uh, what what needs to actually be done when you trigger the job so that it gets queued? Um, there are two main uh, things. One uh, is that um, when when a batch, when a user creates a job, they need to add an annotation that says um, that indicates really which queue should be used for that job. So this is the most, uh, this is the place that is special and that's the only place really where the user running jobs uh, should, um, needs to do something special. So add that that link to, to a cluster, to a queue, to a namespace level queue. Um, uh, the, um, aside from that, the job also needs to be started as suspended. It's a new API uh, or a new flag that we added to jobs um, as of, if I remember right, Kubernetes 121 or 122, uh, it allows you to create the job resource um, without um, without having any pods created. So Q will be the operator that unsuspends the job and leads to uh, pods creation. Uh, the uh, the batch user should only create the batch, the job resource. Um, in in most configurations and in most scenarios, um, you should use simply an admission controller to default that all jobs in the cluster are created uh, as suspended. This way, um, you will make sure that the whole setup is uh, not error prone. Now, when it comes to the definitions of queues, um, typically the end users will not actually do that. That's going to be a batch admin team or some other platform team in an organization that's setting up clusters. Um, in some cases, these are the same people, but in many organizations, we see that these roles are separated. 
so uh, first of all, each namespace should have at least one or more um, queues. Um, those queues are, need to be then linked to cluster queues. So, so essentially you're linking a job to a queue and then that queue is uh, linked to a cluster queue, so a pool of resources. Uh, and the cluster queue is the most important and most complex uh, custom resource that um, you need to configure in your cluster that the uh, infrastructure team needs to set up. Um, and it's uh, and let's take a look at a couple of elements of that uh, cluster queue. I mean, so as I mentioned, it represents um, a pool of resources. It does not have to be a homogeneous pool of resources. As you see on this example, you may have various flavors of resources in the pool. Um, they may be on-demand, spot, uh, or other types of resources. Here you are defining what are the maximum um, pools of resources that would be available to your users. Um, what's particularly important is that these flavors are simply tied to labels and taints. So it, they don't even really have to be truly ident uh, one, one to one matched to like node pools or node groups in your cluster. They need to be matched, they need, they need to match pools of nodes in the cluster that have the same um, uh, labels and taints. Users are able to uh, also force the use of certain, uh, certain uh, flavors through affinities or node selectors. Um, so, as you see here, uh, the robotics team uh, can, um, uh, or maybe one more concept in here that is particularly important, and uh, um, is the fact that um, you may have multiple cluster queues that will be combined in a concept called borrowing cohort. It means that a queue um, could be running jobs inside a particular cluster queue as the primary one in which it runs, but if there is not enough space in it and there is unused capacity in other cluster queues, so in other pools of resources in the cluster, then it is possible to borrow from the other cluster queues. But then if, um, uh, if uh, the primary users of that other cluster queue uh, do need that capacity, um, then it will have to be given back to, to, to the uh, uh, to the, the to the primary users of that cohort, uh, still like eviction mechanisms under implementation right now, so so job preemption. All right, so now uh, let's um, take a zoom in of how Q works and how it's embedded into the overall ecosystem of controllers inside the, your cluster. So first, uh, the your batch admin or um, the infrastructure team um, in in your organization needs to uh, perform the initial setup. So create namespaces, create namespace level queues, and then create cluster level queues that will represent the resource pools. Um, the end users, when they will be starting their jobs. Um, they will uh, create them with the annotation that ties them to a particular queue, and those jobs need to be um, created as suspended. Uh, it is um, uh, quite common or recommended uh, by us that uh, you rely on um, on admission controllers to set some defaults in here. You can use some um, policy frameworks like Gatekeeper that allow you to uh, provide pre predefined um, policies and um, uh, setting certain defaults uh, upon workload admission, so so that you essentially enforce that all jobs created in the cluster are created as suspended, potentially maybe even also assigned to some default queues in the cluster if that's needed. Um, then uh, Q, uh, as the operator here, uh, kicks in. It will be running in your cluster. And um, uh, first, um, uh, at some point, it will decide to admit a job. So a suspended job is one that where there, is a, there are only uh, job resources created in the API server, but there are no pods in the cluster. And um, it will uh, decide to change that suspended flag in the job definition. Um, at some point, uh, based on the order quotas and the order conditions, so essentially when it decides that the job is ready to be ran, it will make a change to that suspended flag, and it will also inject a node affinity uh, to the spec of your job, so that it will tell the scheduler um, to which resource pool your job was assigned. The next controller that kicks in is essentially the job controller, so the standard one, which uh, will notice that the suspended flag was uh, flipped from true to false. 
so now um, it will go on and start creating pods related to uh, your job. Um, and uh, uh, the, the next uh, controller that will pick them up is scheduler, which will see that it has unscheduled pods. It will notice that uh, they are assigned to, uh, through node affinity to a certain resource pool, so it will start assigning pods to specific nodes. On top of this loop, if there is uh, a need for it, cluster autoscaler um, will um, uh, kick in and start adding nodes. We are also working on some more advanced cluster autoscaler integrations, which I will cover later in the presentation. It, the queue does support custom workloads. Uh, so all of the things that you have seen so far was about uh, using um, uh, using the core Kubernetes uh, job controller, um, but we also support um, custom workloads. What's then part particularly important is that you leverage a new uh, custom resource that we have also created called workload. Um, um, workload is essentially a wrapper for the that uh, custom uh, custom uh, job controller, like the one that, for example, Kubeflow or uh, Spark uh, operator are using, um, and it needs uh, that workload Workload uh, um, controller that workload uh, resource needs to support uh, the um, um, one important API, which is uh, suspended resources. So you need to be you need to allow that functionality where Q will uh, see will be able to suspend and unsuspend um, a job and then the actual job the actual custom uh, job controller needs to have that capability that just creates the resource without any pods and then once a flag is changed it um, starts to create uh, pods uh, so then really in that zoomed in, maybe a little bit zoomed in fashion when it comes to that execution sequence, then the workload controller really is going to be um, responsible for adjustments uh, and will work will have to work in tandem with Q to uh, to allow um, to, uh, to unsuspend the job and assign it to a proper uh, proper uh, pool of resources through node affinities. So as I mentioned, this all natively supports um, autoscaler. Um, in the basic fashion, it just works without conflicts, meaning that uh, since it does not re-implement scheduling decisions, uh, it allows you to just execute um, uh, just execute uh, jobs um, and let cluster autoscaler um, add machines as it sees fit or as it sees necessary. What's particularly important is that um, all autoscaling implementations, be the main open source cluster autoscaler or any other alternatives that you may find in the ecosystem, they will um, uh, perform uh, scheduling simulations. So uh, Q just relies on the open source um, uh, autoscaler, the standard one that is not autoscaler, but scheduler that you can find in, the, in uh, 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 Kubernetes. Um, and it will use it uh, to, st it will, it was by not replacing it, it will then go not go into any conflict with a cluster autoscaler. It will still work with custom schedulers that you may decide to use um, for implementation, but then uh, if there are any challenges with it, I mean, you are in control of it as uh, as really you as the users of Kubernetes are the ones deciding to use a custom scheduler and and switch it to, to something else. Um, we have some plans in the future to make um, Q even better integrated with Autoscaler, uh, but that's at the moment work in progress. We primarily would like to solve uh, problems of pre-provisioning infrastructure so that Q unsuspends the job and then sends a request to the Autoscaler so that it um, pre-provisions machines for things like um, co-scheduled jobs where you have the all or nothing semantics and you would like to pre-provision uh, machines before, before the actual job execution. So in summary, um, Q is an um, operator that allows you to decide when jobs are run and when then they still should <coughs> wait and be suspended. It has a variety of configuration parameters and allows you to share resources. Uh, with Q, you should be able to achieve very high allocation levels in your clusters uh, against your the, the limited resources that you may have. So you, you should be able to operate for clusters used for, especially for train batch jobs like machine learning training or um, batch inference. You should be able to achieve efficiencies of 90% or more. Uh, at the moment, Q is in alpha status, so it's an operator that is. Uh, 
uh, running with uh, so is ready for proof of concept. It is feature complete, um, at least for the main main capabilities that we wanted to ship it with. It's not ready yet for production use, so it's primarily for proof of concept and validation. But we are working right now on hardening and productionization, so more robust and reliable releases are just uh, around the corner. And we're also working on integrations with common custom workloads, custom jobs. Um, like Spark or Kubeflow, and we're working also on new features uh, with some top examples um, you can, uh, that you can see on the screen. If you have any questions or you would like to just give Q a try, which I really encourage you to, to do so, you can find all of the information on Q.sh, um, or you can actually reach out to me on social media. You can find my Twitter handle um, on the screen, and uh, thank you, and have a good day. Thanks, Maciek. What a great session that was on how to optimize your compute resources to get the most from your machine learning. OK, that's a wrap. So you all know what that means. It's time to join us at the after party by clicking the Watch Live button on the events agenda page. Today's speakers will also be joining us for some Q&A. And on top of that, we'll have an exciting quiz ready for you. We hope to see you all there. And thank you.